Today, we become legends. Hey, my name's Inter, welcome back to the channel. Uh, we've got year 11, 11.1 patch notes to go over today. Uh, apologies for the terribly formatted uh, Google document, it's not my fault. Uh, apparently the Smite Game website literally just never works, so we, we've got this to kind of go on, rather than the normal uh, fully formatted nice patch notes, but it's still got all the information we need, so uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, I'm going to skip over all the like cross-gen, like Smite 2 stuff. I've already discussed that in many videos up on my channel already, if you're interested in that. But the first thing to talk about is the Celestial Comets, so these will fall down in lanes, I believe starting at 90 seconds into the game is what they said. Yeah, starting at 90 seconds, uh, Celestial Comet will crash down a lane. Uh, deals a small amount of damage and knocks back people that were in the area. If it lands on them, probably won't be too relevant. I imagine they fall quite slowly. Uh, you gotta hit it 10 times with basic attacks and it will knock off little chunks of rock each time and you can pick up those chunks of rock to get a little bit of golden experience. Uh, no matter who hits it, uh, either team can pick up the rocks, but they do, if you hit it, they will like come towards you rather than like in a neutral location. So generally you have the advantage if you're the one hitting it because they'll come towards you and then you can grab all these pips. Uh, when the comet is fully destroyed, it will spawn the Indra Scepter, which can then be picked up uh, when only one god remains in its area. Also, that's like uh, some kind of like not really a capture point, but kind of. I guess, like, uh, you gotta force the enemy out of, like, the general area to pick up the scepter. If, like, an enemy is, like, meleeing you, like, next to the scepter, no one can pick it up, I assume is what that means. Uh, the scepter will then last 90 seconds, and in conquest, 30 seconds after it disappears. I assume that means the scepter disappears, uh, a new comet will spawn. So essentially, every two minutes, you're going to get a new comet spawning in conquest. And uh, in modes that have towers, when both the tier 1 towers in the lane are cleared, the comet will stop spawning there. So that's when the enemy tower and your tower is cleared. So it seems like... Uh, that's kind of interesting, the way they're doing that. Uh, if you're winning the game and your tier 1 isn't destroyed, you're going to keep getting comets in that lane, but if it's a generally quite even game and both teams uh, get the tower a fairly uh, similar amount of time, then uh, comets could start spawning much earlier. And also, comets will start spawning altogether once all the tier 1 towers are destroyed. Obviously, you know, if all three are done in all three lanes, then uh, comets will stop spawning. Uh, these are going to be in every single game mode, so uh, interesting there. We'll get to see them uh, see use in all of the game modes, not just Conquest. Uh, Joust is going back to the J Corruption Season 8 Joust map, uh, for those that are interested in that. Don't really care myself, not a big Joust player. Moving on to Conquest though, so they're switching up the locations of the camp, specifically where they are on the map. A couple of swaps here and there may seem small, these new locations are Breath of Fresh Air, yeah, so just general, like, shifting around of buffs and stuff. Uh, green buff and chess camp have swapped locations, so, um, potentially could change stats a little bit. Maybe, uh, you don't bother with the chess camp and you just leave that open, maybe the jungler gets it after, like, the first wave in mid or something like that, that could work. And then duo lane just do, uh, green and purple straight up together, that, that could, uh, be a new start, potentially. Roaming harpies will now spawn around the green camp camp as well. Uh, shield and cooldown camps have been moved to brand new locations on the edges of the map. Yeah, so these these little, um, I wouldn't even call them side jungles, they're just little like offshoots on the side of uh, solo and duo lane. That is where silver and gold are going to be now rather than being pushed into the middle of the map. Uh, Bastions just get a little bit more tanky and also a slightly more uh, gold reward increase. I think this is a reasonable change, especially in ADC and, and kind of in mid, but even in solo, uh, the Bastions die real quick, so I'm, I'm actually fine with them getting a little bit more tankiness there. Spirit Totems are going to be staying for year 11, which is good in my opinion. I, I do quite like the Spirit Totems. We'll see further down as well that class passives are being removed. And so I think uh, the combination of both of these, like being able to get like 10% cooldown on your buff and then 10% cooldown on like your warrior passive. This is just a solo an example, but it came up in other ways as well. I think it was a little bit too much in terms of the free stats and restricted your build options a little bit. So class passives are going to be gone, but Totems will be staying. I think that's great. I think uh, Totems are a much better way of doing it. You have a lot more control over what you want with these. Uh, Crimson Totem gets uh, increased magical lifesteal and they've added a physical ability lifesteal to it as well. Uh, Golden Totem added five physical and magical penetration, so you now get some flat pen on the Golden Totem. I assume also in addition to the percent pen, it doesn't say that they've removed the percent pen. So that's probably going to be a real strong early game. You're definitely going to want that on like your junglers and uh, maybe your mids and stuff like that. Uh, Cyclops Rogues. The Cyclops Rogues have started getting creative because they're offering a new way to reward those who track them down. Every other defeated Cyclops Rogue will now provide players across uh, access to their wares, being a special item shop outside of the base. This shop is unrestricted, meaning you can buy anything and everything for its duration. We are very excited to- Oh, So in Conquest only, every other Cyclops Road defeated will spawn a jungle shop for allies that allows you to purchase items from the item shop within its range. The jungle shop will last for 60 seconds, and the jungle shop will always start with the second Cyclops Rogue. That is kind of crazy, dude. So everyone can be Changa in, in year 11. That's kind of nuts. 
Definitely going to be some strategizing to do there and some maximizing, you know, maybe if you see uh, the Cyclops rogues in the jungle and I hope and assume they will have an indicator on the fact that it's like uh, one of the shop ones, like maybe the chest is golden instead. I think that would make sense just so you know and you don't have to track whether it was uh, every other rogue because maybe someone on the other side of the map cleared one of the rogues and you didn't realize and then you clear this one and the shop's like in a really bad location. Hopefully they have some way of identifying, uh, sorry, I just tapped my mic. Hopefully they have some way of identifying um, which one of these will, will be giving you the shot but that is very interesting you know maybe as the jungler you can pull them like over to a certain lane that that really wants to uh buy something solo lane specifically will be great for this because solo laners have excellent sustain and they often don't need to back for health and mana anywhere near as much as other lanes do but they also they obviously want to back for items and stuff like that so this could be really interesting i like this uh gonna be a lot to maximize with that uh next up though something i'm a little bit less excited about personally uh the teleporters so basically there's gonna be two teleport pads one in solo one in duo uh in solo, it's where silver buff was. In duo, it's where gold buff was. That's kind of why they've been moved out towards the edges of the map. And basically, you've got to stand on it for... Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to say the amount of time... Oh yeah, here we go. 4.5 seconds. So you got to stand on it for 4.5 seconds and then uh, it activates and takes everyone that was on that teleporter pad to the other pad on the other side of the map. Uh, this I'm really not enthusiastic about. I'll have to see how it plays um, when we actually get into the game and see how it actually feels. Uh, they don't unlock into eight minutes into the game, which is definitely a good safeguard there because if they were active from minute one, it'd just be absolute carnage. But honestly, I feel like it's going to be carnage anyway. Uh, there'll be Nagas guarding the uh, teleporter pads before they spawn so you can get a little bit of extra farm in the first eight minutes of the game until these activate. Uh, you are revealed to enemies the entire time you're on the pad, even when just crossing over them, similar to how the beacon works. And then uh, anyone who teleports is not able to teleport again for 120 seconds. After the teleport pad is used, the pad will slowly reset over 4.5 seconds, but anyone is able to step on it and resume the teleporting wall from where it was, meaning you can follow enemies or allies quickly after they teleport. So yeah, it seems like there's going to be no actual like cooldown on the pad itself. The cooldown is more so tied to you as the player. So if you teleport... Uh, the pad doesn't go on cooldown for 120 seconds. It's just you can't teleport again for 120 seconds. So if someone wants to follow you from your team about 10 seconds later, if they realize the fight's developing, they can do that. Uh, these, I'm just really not a fan of the whole concept, I have to say. Again, I'll have to see how it plays out in-game. Maybe it could be kind of cool for, like, uh, big late-game rotations, like mid-to-late-game rotations and stuff. But I feel like this is just going to result in, like, solo laners teleporting across to duo lane and just absolutely wreaking havoc all the other way around. Like, both duo laners and the jungler that have just ganked duo, they now teleport over to solo and you get four-man ganked like i'm just not sure this is really the best idea it does kind of like take a little bit away from smart rotations as well because everyone can just teleport everywhere uh solo laners as well because they can build teleport you know solo laners could teleport over to do all in fuck everything up maybe get a gold fury and just take tp straight back to their lane uh without having to make any kind of actual rotation they just teleport in everywhere uh i'm not a huge fan of this but again we'll, we'll have to see how it plays out uh, the Stygian Beacon is going to be staying in year 11 as well. However, it no longer culminates in Unleashed Titans. So Unleashed Titans are completely gone. Uh, Beacon stays. I think this is a pretty smart decision, in my opinion. Unleashed Titans were cool, but I think having them as like a one-season mechanic is probably the way to go with it. Uh, but now, instead of the Unleashed Titans, each team that captures the Beacon will deal damage to all frontline enemy structures. So obviously, that means the frontmost uh, tower or phoenix or whatever in the lane. So if uh, the tier 1's up, it hits the tier 1. If the tier 1's down, it hits the tier 2. If the tier 2's down, it hits the phoenix. Each time the Beacon is captured, regardless of which team captures it, the damage dealt will increase up to three times. So it does 500, 650, and then 800. Uh, all frontline enemies. Oh my god. Okay, Beacon is going to be even more important to contest now then. Uh, this damage can kill towers, but will never bring a Phoenix. Ah, so it can't destroy Phoenixes. That is a good safeguard, in my opinion. Um, once you're on that third capture, you know, if you, if you get one of those and the Phoenix had just respawned, uh, even, honestly, one of the lower ones if the Phoenix has just respawned, you could time that perfectly and just blow up, like, two Phoenixes that have just respawned off of your Siege. It is kind of a smart play, but it's also, like, not not really, because if you're trying to capture the Beacon and the enemy team has to contest it and then you just send someone to pick off the Phoenix with a bomb or something like that, uh, I think I think it's smart that it's not able to kill phoenixes but this is a lot of damage dude 800 damage to all structures like that's essentially 2400 damage split across all three lanes uh beacon's gonna be very important to contest in year 11 it looks like i do like this idea uh, maybe these numbers need to be tuned down ever so slightly though i'm, I'm not entirely sure uh, Fire Giant gets some small updates in year 11 as well. Uh, the Fire Giant has a brand new attack called Firefall, which summons like a beam that essentially tracks you, and uh, the Fire Giant heals for any damage dealt with that beam. And additionally, the Fire Giant now spawns an effigy when it reaches 85% health, so when you've like kind of officially started the Fire Giant, you're not just dancing, you're not trying to pull it and bait people in, you properly like started uh, committing to burning down the Fire Giant. Uh, the effigy spawns with 750 health and can be damaged by both basic attacks and abilities. When it's destroyed, the Fire Giant takes 15% more damage from all sources for 15 seconds. So basically, when you're ready to burn fire 
hit this and burn it down. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, they have changed the spawn time for a few camps. So blue spawns 15 seconds later, duo side speed camp spawns 15 seconds later, and chest camp spawns uh, 30 seconds in. Uh, so I did mention this further up that maybe like uh, the chest camp won't be done at the start. Obviously, it's not going to be done at the start anymore. So that looks like something that the jungler and all the mid will take if they have pressure wave one, or maybe even if they don't have pressure because it's uh, your side of the map. A uh, bunch of XP and gold shifts and stuff. Uh, don't really care about that. I'm not that deep on the game that I can analyze what this is going to do. Uh, realistically, probably not much, but uh, someone smarter than me can look at that. Uh, all three ranks modes are now hard reset. We'll be planning on doing a soft reset every other patch uh, starting at 11.3. That is interesting. Uh, I can't remember the last time we had a hard reset. It's been a while, so uh, that's, that's going to be absolute carnage day one for ranks. Maybe I'll give it a week or two before I start queuing ranked in year 11. Uh, hard resets are always just absolute carnage. Uh, you just literally have masters in, in games with bronzes, and that's like literally how the system is intended to work when it's a hard reset because everyone's at 1500. Uh, Duel, the following gods are now banned and the following gods are now unbanned. For those of you that care about Duel, you can pause here and read that if you want. I'm not too interested. Uh, also, also these ones. Uh, recipes were removed from the game. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. It makes sense that recipes were removed. I think they were they were cool as a season mechanic, but I don't think they were something that should have stayed in the game the entire time. Uh, shards. So Claw and Carapace Shard have been removed from the game. Understandable. They were by far the least used ones, especially Carapace Shard. I literally can't think of a single time uh, in the last like six months that I've seen anyone buy that. Uh, Claw Shard was a little bit more popular on, on some gods like Anubis and, and maybe even Hades that wanted like that lifesteal. But they have now added a few new shards and most of these are in fact, I think all of them. Uh, yeah, all of them are basically the old recipes, but now as uh, passive shards. So, Golden Shard, all basic attacks will also hit for 15% damage to gods and 25% to minions. So, I believe that's weaker than Golden Gooseberries, uh, which makes sense considering it's a passive shard that you get at level 1, whereas Golden Gooseberries took... Uh, I don't really know how long. I'm not a big ADC player. Five, seven minutes or something like that to get stacked up and done. Uh, Sturdy Shard being hit by how crowd control creates the pulse. This is basically um, Sturdy Stew, uh, the recipe. And then Vibrant Shard, every 100 units traveled, you gain a buff. This is basically um, Party Punch. So yeah, the Party Punch, Sturdy Stew, and Golden Gooseberries are now passive shards that you can get from the start of the game. You don't have to do any of the questing that you had to do with recipes. Okay, moving on though to Relic Quests. So yeah, they're going to be slightly reworking the Relic system in Year 11, and I have to say this is another change I'm not a massive fan of. Uh, so basically, this is a lot of uh, wall of text. The long and short of it is that relics do not require quests to upgrade, which we'll get into in a second. And there's only uh, one branch of them now. They basically turned them back into what the initial relic system was before they added all the cool like branching relic upgrades. They've just gone back on themselves. Uh, I think that was a really great change that they made in, uh, what was it, season nine, I think. I think it was really cool. And now they kind of just like removed any of that player choice and you just like uh, brain dead pick beads and agus and they upgrade for free with quests. Uh, I think it removes a lot of skill from the game and a lot of like, freedom of choice and decision making and stuff like that i'm really not a fan of them just like removing options like this it was the same thing with um starter items back in the day like uh starter items and then they moved to blessings where you just brain dead by the blessing for your role and never worry about it whatsoever and then they added the season eight starter items which are one of the best changes they've ever made to the game in my opinion it gives you so much variety so much freedom to build how you want and, and this is just essentially going back on that for relics and i'm not a huge fan of it so all relic upgrades can now be upgraded for free by completing a variety of quests you may still purchase relic upgrades for gold but i don't see why you would ever do this unless you were absolutely desperate. Uh, most of the relic upgrades really aren't that relevant. Uh, like, they are. They're nice to have, but I don't see why you would ever waste your gold on them. No one did uh, initially. Like, the, you only upgraded your relics once your entire build was done, because uh, you had nothing else to sink your gold into other than power potions. So, I don't really see any reason to even leave this option here. I mean, it's nice, I suppose. It adds a little bit of variety. Like, if you really feel like you might need a certain relic upgrade for a team fight, you can just do that and bypass the quest, but it feels a little bit clunky in my my opinion. I, I feel like if you're gonna do this, which in my opinion you shouldn't, I think they should have just left relics as they are. I think it's a dumb change, but uh, if you were gonna do this, I feel like you should just go whole hog and just say questing is how you do it now. Uh, in order to accommodate for this automatic upgrade system, all relics now only have one tier three option. Yeah, uh, let's make the game worse and remove all of your player choice uh, just so that we can have an automated upgrade system with quests that are stupid. Uh, sorry, I, I really don't like this change. I don't want to rag on them too much, but I just feel like there's absolutely no reason to make this change. Relics were fine as they are. Uh, tier 1 and Tier 2 relics have unique quests that also scale depending on if the relic is purchased first or second throughout the game. So uh, your second relic will quest faster because obviously the game is going to be over much sooner once, you've, once you're after level 12. Uh, so the first quest is kill 140 minions or 80 minions for your second relic. And the second quest is deal instances of damage or crowd control to enemy gods. And that is 90 or 60 for your second relic. So yeah, essentially play the game. 
Uh, don't think about anything. Don't make a choice between what relic upgrade you want to go. Uh, don't have any player agency. Just play the fucking game and you will get your relics upgraded. Uh, it's brain dead. I'm not a fan of it, but it is what it is. Uh, Belt of Frenzy and Cursed Anchor removed from the game. Aegis of Judgment is removed from the game. Aegis of Acceleration is still there, and that will be like the normal upgrade. So basically, they're going to be removing a lot of the uh, branches, like because uh, you had two different kinds of each relic. Uh, basically, one of those kinds is going to be removed, and one is going to stay for the most part. Uh, corrupted Blink Rune is gone. Scorching Blink Rune stays, but enemies affected by the flames are also have their movements being attack speed slowed. So this is something they're also doing. They're kind of folding the effects of some of the uh, relics, like branches that they were removing, into the one that's staying. Uh, Bracer of Radiance, Bracer of Illumination is removed. Bracer of Brilliance, no changes. Uh, Avatar is removed. Aesthetic stays in. Heavenly Wings. Hasten Wings is removed. Heavenly Wings now grants a little bit of attack speed based on level. Uh, and Entangling Wings is going to be the one that stays. So you're going to be having the root one. And the Hastened Wings has been removed from the game. Uh, Horrific Emblem. Uh, Trembling Terror is gone. They have removed the attack speed slow on Horrific Emblem, but it now has uh, an anti-heal effect. So as we saw further up, they've removed Cursed Ankh, but they've folded that into um, Horrific Emblem now. So Horrific Emblem is now what you need if you're going to be going for anti-heal. Uh, shell, Fortifying Shell is gone. Phantom Shell stays. Uh, that is the most dumb change I've ever seen in my life. See, this is the problem with this kind of system. They've kept Phantom Shell in the game. So basically, uh, if you buy Shell... Uh, you you kind of feel bad about buying shell if you're not in a matchup with walls, right? Like normally phantom shell was just there if you needed it in those few matchups where you might care about walls and you would just go fortifying shell normally. Whereas now you basically have a useless effect uh, that's not going to be relevant in 90% of your games. So you just feel bad buying shell. Like th this whole system's trash in my opinion. Uh, Chaotic Beads has gone from the game. Temporal Beads stays. Understandable. Temporal Beads was the one that everyone bought. Uh, Shield of Thorns has a slight rework. So using this item grants you 50% damage mitts as you store all damage taken and then explore dealing 100 plus 50% of the damage taken as magical damage, uh, up to 25% of enemies max health. I was going to say, they're going to have to have some kind of check on that, surely. While this is active, enemies can only lifesteal 75%. Uh, yeah, so Thorns is basically going to be a store up the damage and burst it, basically kind of like Aegis of Judgment that has been removed from the game. Aegis of Acceleration is now the only upgrade. Uh, Sundering Spear, so Siphon has been removed from the game, Blast has no changes, makes sense, no one really built Siphon. Uh, teleport Fragment, Heroic Teleport is removed from the game, Persistent Teleport, new effect after teleporting you gain. Ah, so they basically folded in the Heroic Teleport effect onto Persistent Teleport with no nerfs. I mean, we're already going TP in solo, but I think you're definitely going TP now, dude. Uh, like a 60 second effective cooldown teleport with the new teleporters that are also in the game, and you get slow immunity, movement speed, and protections every time you do that teleport. Uh, this is going to be broken, dude. Uh, if you're not going to teleport on your soul and it's your trolling in the new patch, in my opinion. Uh, we do have an entirely new relic, though, Divine Barrier. So you deploy a 40-unit-wide wall of Divine Light that reduces the damage of all enemy basic attacks that pass through it by 30%. Additionally, all enemies that pass through the barrier are slowed, and the barrier lasts for 30 seconds. God damn, that's going to be good for, like, sieges and uh, fire giant fights, gold fury fights, that kind of stuff. Uh, as it upgrades, it doesn't seem to change very much other than the cooldown. The cooldown goes down a little bit. Uh, cooldown stays the same for the tier 3, but it increases the damage of all allied basic attacks, so... You kind of have, like, a mini uh, upgraded, like, Thoth Glyph, I suppose. Uh, this is really interesting, though. Th th this I do like a lot. But imagine if we could have had this and we could have also had a different version that, like, could have done something else cool. I, I just really don't like this whole Relic System rework. I think it's trash, but uh, this is a cool. This is cool. Uh, this is going to be really awesome for team fighting and, like, breaking sieges and stuff like that. A lot of play. I think, like, this is going to be a main build for supports, honestly, if you want to play around objectives. Uh, going to be very popular in high-level play, I imagine. Maybe not so much in lower levels where your teammates aren't coordinating with you and, like, knowing what to do around your barrier and stuff, but in high-level play, I think this is going to be very popular. Uh, consumables. Mana Chalice has been removed from the game. Who could have guessed? Uh, no one built this, and if you built it, you're trolling, unless it's maybe hell support. That's basically the only application for that item. Uh, no reason for it to stay in the game. Fine with it being removed. Uh, there is the, now the Proximity Ward. This is a ward that allows you to see enemy movements within 20 units. It does respect line of sight and can't see through walls or stealth. If an enemy guard enters its vision range, the wall will explode after 1.5 seconds, slowing enemy guards. It remains for 5 minutes or until killed, and you can only carry one at a time. Uh, so only carry one at a time. I imagine this is sort of like a sentry ward slot type thing. So maybe you can carry two regular wards and then you can carry one sentry ward or one proximity ward or one raven ward, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, so the raven ward, this is a ward that flies along a 500 unit, 500 unit line, damn, that allows you to see all enemy movements within 50 units. It does not respect line of sight, but can't see through stealth. Yeah, so this is essentially a late game pickup. Uh, you're going to be still wanting regular long duration wards for the earlier mid game, I imagine. Maybe you'll pick up some proximity wards, but like regular wards, sentries, uh, I guess vision shard is what you're going to be wanting in the early game. But then I think in the late game, uh, some people will be, will be 
buying sentries, and then probably the front line will be buying raven wards, I would imagine. Uh, you are definitely going to want these uh, 500 units is, I believe, a Merkel, a max distance Merkel, which is basically most of the map. 500 units will cover most of the map, I think. And yeah, this is going to be really nice. Uh, I do like this a lot. I think it's a great addition. The proximity ward is cool and all, but I think this raven ward is going to be absolutely sick. Uh, it's going to make late game team fight plays, like uh, round objectives and stuff like that, uh, be so much more interesting. If you're like carrying a couple of raven wards, you can just send them out and like get vision of all the enemies and like where they're at if they're trying to contest all that kind of stuff. Uh, and notably not countered by like sentry wards. You know, normally I have all that ward wars around the objectives and stuff like that. Uh, that's going to be a lot less relevant now, if anything, because people can just fire off a raven ward and have vision of uh, the enemies with no counter play. Uh, these can be very popular, I imagine, especially in high level play. Uh, Lifesteal rework. So lifesteal is being adjusted game wide to be 50% less effective against minions. To accomplish this, all lifesteal on minions has been decreased by 50% and all lifesteal on items and abilities have been increased by roughly 50%. So in essence, this will decrease lifesteal on minions by 25% while increasing lifesteal on gods by 50%. Additionally, the lifesteal caps have been raised, 80% uh, for physical, 70% for magicals now. Uh, this makes a lot of sense. I do like this change. It allows them to sort of uh, make lifesteal more powerful uh, in like the team fights and when it matters and less powerful in terms of just like, oh, I'm going to walk off. I'm going to heal my entire health bar from a jungle camp or a minion wave and then immediately be back in the fight. I think it's a smart change. Uh, it allows them to make lifesteal more powerful without it being completely dominant in terms of just like PvE um, healing up after team fights and stuff like that. Uh, Crimson Claws, new item which builds from Bound Gauntlet, the uh, Devo's side of the tree, I believe. 50 physical power, 20% attack speed, 15% lifesteal. Lifestealing from enemies while at full health grants you the... Ah, ah so it's old uh, Book of the Dead. You get uh, up to 15% of your maximum health shield and you can over lifesteal with that. Uh, this is probably going to be quite popular, I imagine. Um, the stats on it are pretty decent-ish. It depends on the cost of it. 25.50. Yeah, the stats are okay, but yeah, having an extra 15% maximum health at the start of a fight, essentially, is, is probably going to be quite powerful. So I imagine this will be picked up a lot. Uh, probably going to be a favorite of the casuals, but might even be strong enough that it, it could be picked up uh, in, in serious play as well. Uh, down here, we have all of the changes to basically increase uh, the lifesteal on all of the items, as was mentioned, and also on some god abilities and stuff like that as well. Uh, Rejuvenating Heart gets a rework. Uh, if you don't know what this item is, it's one of the new healer items that they added in 10.3. No one used it ever, so I'm not surprised it's getting reworked. Uh, the new passive, uh, it now comes with lifesteal, by the way. The new passive, lifestealing off of enemy gods heals yourself and nearby allies within 40 units of you for 33% of that healing. Uh, this is gonna probably be trash, I would imagine. It's a magical item, so like you're Mage, I guess your mage could be like healing your hunter with the lifesteal maybe, but like mages are just going to be throwing out an ability and that already gets reduced by 33%, so it's essentially going to be one ninth of the damage that you deal that you're actually healing to your backliners. I don't really see this seeing use, honestly. It seems like a very weird item. I like the idea of it, but I don't think it's going to see much play. Uh, more stuff in terms of increasing magical lifesteal, uh, Typhon's Fang similar stuff. Uh, all this stuff is just the same, just increasing all the lifesteal values by 50%. Uh, stacking items. So this is another one that I'm not a huge fan of uh, at all. They are essentially reworking starter items in a similar way to relics in that they're just going to take away like all player uh, expression and skill and, and agency and just say, hey, fuck it. You, you just do, you play the game and your item will stack up for free. I'm not a huge fan of this. So all last hit kill stacking items are being reworked and now gain stacks from dealing damage to enemies. Dealing damage to enemy gods grants double contribution towards stacks meaning you can now stack these items faster by actively fighting enemies or poking them. Yeah, let's turn every game mode into arena. I get it. Uh, these items are unbanded assault. Makes sense. You can obviously stack them very easily in assault now. If anything, they'll be uh, stacking stronger in assault than regular game modes. Uh, Devos gain stacks by dealing a total of 30,000 damage to gods or minions. Wait, what? Oh, I guess it counts towards minions as well. Right, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 30,000 damage is probably reasonable. Uh, max stacks decrease from 75 to 50, and then, yeah, they've just rebalanced uh, what you get, basically, for the um, new stack count. Transcendence, uh, 35,000 damage, uh, 15 mana per stack, total of 750 mana. Book of Thoth gain stacks uh, equal to a total of 45,000, so Book of Thoth is going to be the hardest one to stack, which kind of makes sense. Uh, it had quite a high stack count originally. Uh, Warlocks is uh, 55,000. And yeah, they've just rebalanced a bunch of the stats around on all these items to fit with the new stacking mechanics. Uh, not a fan of this, honestly. Uh, just removing last... It's like, this is just like the relic change. I don't see any reason to do this. This is just like uh, making the game worse for absolutely no reason. I think no one had a problem with stacking items, really. Uh, unless they just... I mean, it's probably catering to the casual player base. I'm going to be completely honest with you. If I'm going to be brutally honest, it's probably like them just wanted to be like, oh, people who play Arena, people who play Jowls, people who play Assault, we want you to be able to use these stacking items uh, without caring about the fact 
that is going to make Conquest uh, very much more dumb, in my opinion. Uh, revived items. So some of the items that got removed are coming back. Void Shield is back. Uh, void Stone is back in the form of Void Domaru. So it's not going to have a uh, power on it. Uh, void Shield doesn't have power on it either. They're really sticking to their guns in terms of uh, not allowing items to have power and protections at the same time. And they are coming back in their percent uh, protection reduction forms, not their flat reduction forms that they had uh, in their early lives. So that's pretty cool. I do like the void items returning. I think they'll probably see a good amount of play. Uh, Blackthorn Hammer is back as well. 35 power, 250 health, 200 mana. And then uh, the same passive. Basically, you get 10% cooldown while you're on uh, high mana and you get an MP5 while you're on low mana. Yeah, very happy to see these items return. Uh, they, they were some of my favorites back in the day and I removed them at the start of year 10 and I was a little bit sad about it. So yeah, pretty happy with that. Uh, glyphs. Players now, may now purchase any number of glyphs. Envenom Deathbringer and Heavy Executioner are removed. Devoted Deathbringer is a new glyph. So before we get into all the new stuff, uh, this is a dumb change in my opinion. They tried this at the start and it was just stupid uh, because the problem with allowing people to buy any number of glyphs, they, they tried to explain it on the patch note show. Uh, in fact, they explain it here. We've been looking for ways to allow players to spend their late game gold. This is a problem, I agree, but this is not the way to solve it because... Either you plan your entire build around having six glyphs and then you can spend your gold late game or you build normally like not an idiot and then you're going to have like one or two glyphs in your build. It's not really going to solve the problem. And they tried this at the launch of glyphs and it was dumb as hell. I think if anything, they should have reworked the system to allow you to like have a major and a minor glyph. I've made the suggestion in a full video before where I'd suggested a rework for the glyph system. Uh, honestly, I don't think it really needed a rework. I think it's kind of fine as it is, but it would have been cool to have like major and minor glyphs. But allowing people to just purchase any number of glyphs Glyphs. This just like either you don't build items that have glyphs and you have a better power curve and then you feel bad late game or you do build a bunch of items that have glyphs and then you have a really weird power curve but you feel better about it late game because you have six glyphs and the enemy has two because they didn't plan their entire build around the game going 45 minutes. And that's kind of the problem with it. No one knows if a game's going to go 45 minutes. So making your build around having six glyphs just in case the game goes 45 minutes is just dumb in my opinion. I uh, don't like this change at all. But some new glyphs. Uh, the new glyphs I do think are fairly cool though. So Devoted Deathbringer. Uh, your critical strike chance is multiplied by 1.3. And for each 5% you go over the 100% cap, you gain 10 physical power. So this is going to be very interesting. Um, I think this is either going to be broken or completely trash. Uh, and... I think my initial impression is that it's going to be trash. I know that's kind of um, a spicy take. Uh, this item looks like it could be really insane and crit historically has been really good. The problem is you're going to have to build so much crit chance that you're going to be really lacking on like all the other aspects of your build. I mean, the crit build is strong right now with um, the arrow starter. But the problem is like to get... I mean, if you're wanting to get any reasonable amount of physical power out of this, you probably want to go like at least 25% over the cap, right? Get like 50 extra physical power. The problem is you are then building 125% crit chance. Oh, I guess you're not building 125%. You're building like 95, 100% crit chance and that's multiplied by 1.3. The problem with that is you're just going to have like a major lack of stats in other areas that you build. Like you'd have to go like Rage, Bladed Boomerang and Deathbringer uh, and maybe like the starter as well. Ah, uh, then again... Maybe with the starter, like starter plus rage plus DB is probably already close to 100% crit chance and then it gets multiplied by 1.3. Okay, now nah, maybe I take it back. This item might be good. This item might be quite good. Uh, as long as you can get to a reasonable amount of crit chance to, to be able to get like maybe 50, 40, 50 power out of this and only use up three item slots, it's probably fine. Because then you still have three item slots left for your attack speed, your percent pen, your lifesteal, all that other kind of stuff that you need. Because like you're going to need your starter, you're going to need devos, you're going to need at least 1% pen item. You probably want 2% pen items and then usually those have attack speed on them as well. Executioner, dominance, that kind of stuff. And then you got room for like three crit items. Yeah, it's, it's probably good actually. I take it back. This, this item probably is really good. Uh, Invenom Executioner, they have essentially uh, moved the Invenom Deathbringer glyph because they have added a new one. They've moved it to Executioner. So now you don't necessarily have to be a crit hunter to be able to access anti heal uh obviously um what's the name of the item no one builds it toxic blade toxic blade does exist but uh they've now moved it to envenomed executioner so toxic blade is probably going to be more of like a, an auto attack jungler item potentially and moving on to some general item balance so mannequin scepter they removed the protections and added seven percent attack speed this makes sense it was always weird that this item just had a little bit of physical protection for kind of no reason uh, attack speed synergizes with it better uh, mannequin Hidden Blade, remove the damage reduction, similar change, out of 15% attack speed, decrease the slow duration, but increase the strength of the slow. Uh, mannequin Mace, increase the attack speed slightly, Eye of the Jungle, remove the attack speed and added 7 physical protection. So from Protector of the Jungle, they've done the same, remove the attack speed, decrease physical protection by 10 and added 25 magical protection. 
I mean, this kind of makes sense. It always was weird that this item had attack speed on it. It did feel nice late game, though, when you were just, like, a normal ability-based jungler, but you just had 35% extra attack speed. It made, like, your air cancels and general, like, chase down with autos when your abilities run cooldown. It made that feel a lot better. It's going to be a weird item now. Uh, probably still will be good, though. Uh, you're going to get 25 of each pros, and you also get that... Um, I think it's 15% now. They change it quite a lot to 12. Like, uh, I'm not sure if it's 12 or 15, but an increase in your protections overall. Uh, Spartan Flag. Uh, they have removed power completely from Spartan Flag, but added 35 of both protections and increased the passive attack speed. So this makes sense. I mean, Spartan Flag should just be removed, in my opinion, and replaced with something more interesting. I think Spartan Flag is a really trash design overall, but yeah, removing the power and adding protections to it is going to make it a lot more viable. We'll probably see it being picked up in the support role quite a lot. Uh, the problem is it's just hard to use, and why would you go Spartan Flag over Wall Banner? That's kind of the problem. Uh, Dawnbringer, they have increased the power by 10 and decreased the health by 100. Uh, Runeforce, Shammer, and Glyphs increased the power, decreased the health as well. Uh, Frostbound, same thing. Jam of Iso, increased health and decreased the passive internal cooldown to 5 seconds. Makes the item better. Will we ever see Jam of Isolation be good, though? I don't know. It's kind of a weird trash item. So yeah, basically all of the hammers now have a little bit more power, but uh, they have a little bit less health. Shadow Drinker, increased stealth and movement speed duration from 3 seconds to 5 seconds. This item is just really weird to use. I'm not sure if this kind of buff will really do anything for it. Uh, Mystical Mail, something uh, that I completely forgot existed in the game. Who has bought this item in like the last 4 years of Smite? Probably no one. Uh, increased protections by 5, increased damage per level from 1 to 1.5, and decreased the cost of it a little bit. I think if anything, to make this item viable, they should uh, nerf the damage of it a little bit, but make it cost like 2,000 gold. If, if they made it cheap, I think this item would see a lot of play just uh, for people that struggle to clear the wave in the early game. We've seen a lot of that recently, so like uh, especially your Guardians, you know, like your Sobex and your maybe your Jing Chens and, and stuff like that. Like Guardian Solos would probably like it a lot if it was a lot cheaper. The problem is it just comes online quite late and by the time it does come online your abilities are ranked up enough that you can clear the wave effectively anyway and it kind of doesn't really serve a purpose. Uh, Shogun's Kasari, they have removed the cooldown and added attack speed. A um, little bit of a weird change, I guess... I don't, I don't know if I like that. Shogun's Kasari always felt nice because you could buy it on supports if you wanted to, whereas, like, this attack speed is completely pointless for supports, and supports really wanted the cooldown because they don't get a lot of cooldown early on in their builds if they're rushing, like, Thebes and stuff like that. Also, their starters um, exclusively don't have cooldown, I think. So, yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I like this change. It, it kind of, like, pushes the item out of support. It makes it better, probably, for... Um, in fact, it definitely makes it better for, like, warrior solos, like Armor and Bologna and stuff like that, so I'm, I'm happy about that, but... They've kind of just, like, nerfed the item for supports, which is why I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, Transcendence. Remove 10% cooldown on Evolve and added 10% physical pen. This is now the best item in the game. Build Transcendence every time. Uh, GG. Uh, Pythagoras Peace. Remove 10% cooldown. Increase the power by 5 and increase the health by 50. Uh, portion of power. Remove 10% cooldown. Add 10 pen. Um, why is it not percent pen? I feel like it would make more sense for Portion of Power to be percent pen. Also, there's a very small possibility that people start buying this immediately at level 10 again for the flat pen, but probably not. Uh, yeah, but happy to see the cooldown gone from it. Cooldown is a ridiculously oversaturated stat, and that's probably why they're removing it from a lot of these items. Uh, it's way too easy to get 40% cooldown to the point where you're really struggling to not overcap cooldown on, on some gods, especially Warriors and Solo Lane. Uh, now that the class passive is removed, it's going to be a lot easier to kind of fit cooldown into your build without overcapping now. But yeah, they've, they've removed cooldown from a lot of the ancillary items that had it. Uh, yeah, class passives are gone from the game. I mentioned that earlier. Good riddance. They were uh, trash. They caused more problems than they tried to fix. I don't think they were fun at all. Uh, moving on to some god changes, though. Daji increased the damage scaling per tick on her one by 5% and increased the slow by 5% at all ranks as well. Uh, Daji, a very volatile character. If you buff her too much, she becomes ridiculously strong in the meta, so maybe we'll see a bit more of her here. Cleaner, tearing the veil, five seconds off the cooldown. No one really cares. Um, Sukuyomi gets a little bit more healing from his Shingetsu and Mangetsu. Uh, Art Yours, life tap and heavy charge, or maybe just life tap. I'm not sure how they do the notation with this. I think if it's in brackets, it is just like the life tap. Uh, that's how like they do notation. So I think it's just her three in druid form, but it could be in both forms as well. Uh, reduced by two seconds. Pretty important there. Kabraka and Seismic Crush decreased the cooldown in the early game, but it's the same in the late game. Should help its learning phase a little bit. Uh, Kumba. Increase the damage on throwback by 5 at all ranks, and the flying minion damage by also 5 at all ranks. Who cares? This god's trash. Uh, anyway, no one's really going to care about 5 damage. Uh, Fafnir Coerce increases self-heal by uh, quite a lot in the late game. So in the early game, not really going to matter, and it's not the ability you level first. But yeah, in the late game, you're going to be able to sustain yourself a little bit better with this. Uh, Charybdis decreased item damage reduction from 25% to 20%, so she'll be a little bit better with stuff like kin size now, and increase the splinter damage scaling by 10%. That's quite a big change. Uh, Neath, they're buffing 
think Nice. Interesting. I feel like Nice is kind of fine right now. Nice seeing like a good amount of play, I would say. Um, all they've done is added five base damage and five percent scaling to World Weaver. They're probably not going to make any difference. Uh, e set circle protection reduced the damage to fully charge from eight hundred to four thousand to seven hundred to thirty five hundred. So they're going to make E set a little bit more viable in the late game and I guess in the early game a little bit as well. Uh, Tiamat summon beast shifted the slow from 80% for one second to 40% for two seconds. Probably a buff overall, I would say that. Uh, the strong slow is important for like one second. It's almost a root at that point. But yeah, I think slowing them for longer is probably more important. 40% uh, is usually enough that you can very easily stick to people and stop them juking and stuff. So it's probably an overall buff, I would say. Uh, increase the execute threshold on consume to 50% at all ranks. Uh, I'm not a Tiamat player. I don't know how her leveling order works. Uh, if you don't level this ability normally, then this is a really big buff. If you do level it normally in the early game, then it's probably not going to matter. Uh, grounding dive decreased cooldown uh, in the early game, but the same late game and the same thing for rising flies. So she can change chances a little bit more in the early game, give her a bit more freedom in terms of uh, casting. Uh, Merlin gets the same change, basically. Uh, a little bit more freedom to change stances in the early game, but the same cooldown late game. Uh, Guan Yu, Conviction, decrease mana cost. Vamana, uh, increase attack speed conversion on his passive and increase the base duration and the max duration on his ults. So they're undoing a little bit of what they did to Vamana. Uh, kind of makes sense. Problem is, I uh, don't see why they're like trying to tweak around his ult and stuff. Like, uh, just buff his base kit uh, or rework his base kit. His base kit's so trash and boring, but his ult is always problematic. Uh, Osiris gets more buffs. How long is it going to take people to realize Osiris is good, dude? Jesus Christ. I can't believe people aren't playing him. Uh, increase the attack speed debuff from 20% all ranks to uh, scaling up to 30% and decrease the cooldown on his ult by 5 seconds. Uh, Odin, decrease the stacks on his passive from 5 to 4, but they've increased the movement speed from 4 to 5, so it's just easier to stack now, uh, and they've increased the power as well. So yeah, same amount of overall stats, but it's just easier to stack now. Uh, back at Kojira, they have decreased the protection conversion from 30 to 25. Um, I've honestly not been playing too much regular casual smite and running into back at Kojira lately. It, it could be that he's not actually that strong and this is all he needs. Uh, but, you know, regardless, the god's just super frustrating and I'm not a fan of him. But yeah, that is all for the year 11 patch notes, boys. Uh, I have to say, mostly a bad patch. Uh, we've had some good patches lately, and, and I've been very uh, appraising of high res and their decisions lately, but this patch uh, is really a big miss, in my opinion. There's some cool stuff, uh, a lot of co like cool returning items uh, and stuff like that, uh, new items, uh, like new glyphs and stuff like that. A lot of the new stuff is quite cool. I think the conquest changes are good for the most part. Uh, the new beacon thing is awesome. But, like, teleporters, not a huge fan. Relics, trash. Trash. I can't believe that what they've done to relics. Absolute garbage. Uh, allowing everyone to buy six glyphs is not a major deal, but I'm not really a huge fan of it. Uh, Celestial Comets feel like they're just going to be, like, a, a whatever, nothing addition. Honestly, maybe I'm just a little bit jaded because of all the Smite 2 stuff's been going on. Maybe I'm just not as excited for these changes as I normally would be because I'm just uh, really hyped for Smite 2 and wanting to get to play that. But uh, this doesn't seem like a great patch in my opinion. I give this patch like a 5 out of 10. There's, there's plenty of really bad changes alongside some really good changes as well. But yeah, what do you guys think? Uh, let me know down below and I will catch you guys in another one later on. Have a great day and peace out, you nerds.